so these things are also gone or disintegrated or never gain much traction, which again, as I think, is, is, is part of the difficulty we're at. The fourth thing, I think, is, of course, is the, civic, the, the civil society organizations in Canada have been relatively uh, marginalized now and not many are acting as social forces, a major social forces, a little bit in around some of the particular campaigns, but none of them are acting as big social movements, aggregating people into fighting social forces and being able to contest political power, that is, being able to impact the political balance of, of force. Fifth is the point I mentioned earlier, is quite clearly the capacity, what set Canada apart from the U.S. for so long, and even to some extent, unions in, in the other parts of the advanced capitalist country was that the Canadian labor movement was fighting. It was fighting through the 1980s in a moment of concession and was fighting in the 1990s. Uh, but now quite clearly, this is not the case. The CAW, which was the leader of the fight against concessions, is now a concession, union of concessions. QP has also been, for whatever rhetoric it has on paper, it's also been engaged in a range of concessions, particularly at the municipal level and the difficulty of fighting uh, P3s and a range of other structures. Uh, we also see some of the tension in the other key militant force was Cup W in Canada, and we saw it partly by the change of leadership from uh, Bork to Lemelin uh, over the last little bit, which partly came over frictions over, over the last few contracts and represents a similar kinds of impasse there. Uh, so I think... We're at particular difficulties. I think that is the political challenge that we have to see that's before us. I think there are a range in this situation, good campaigns that are occurring in a lot of areas around electricity, water, health care, etc. But we're going to have to find ways to make those campaigns not only particular good campaigns against such and such act of privatization, but also as ways that they're accumulating our organizational strength and we have to find ways so that become more significant anti-neoliberal alliances in their fight backs. That is, we're going to have to find ways to knit them together. Uh, otherwise, they're going to keep spinning, sp continuing to, to spin. Secondly, quite clearly, people who are still redistributional social democrats, that is believing in some form of redistribution and some form of strengthening the redistributional politics of the state, have to seriously reflect about their political relationship to third wayism and if there's any political space left there anymore. Uh, and whether they're going to hang on as we've seen some of the problems systematically in the labor parties in Britain, in New Zealand, in Australia where they've hung on and continued down that track and not broken with it and therefore rearticulated in a different way to the, le the wider left again, rethinking what that kind of politics might be to a different late left and to a, re a left of a different kind of pluralism. Finally, the radical left has to finally get serious. Uh, and it has to get serious on rethinking its politics and attempting to organize again. And imagine the possibility and the reality of making a different society. It is time we left all the formulations of the historical communist parties, the, post -tro the Trotskyist and post-Trotskyist parties behind, and began rethinking what a dynamic, broad, radical left might look like. There are many developments occurring in many parts of the world. There are significant developments of moving in this direction that we can see and are drawing many inspiration for many of us in Latin America, uh, in terms of Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, we know the cases, which are attempting to form new parties of a different kind. We also see some important developments along this line in Europe, in the Dedlinka, in Germany, in the, in, the, in the Greek new party, in the left bloc in Portugal, uh, the way that the LCR in France is rethinking, and it's finally time in Canada that we stopped sitting on our hands and began rethinking a new politics and began creating new political organizations that can begin to move in that direction and be part of this process of building a 21st century socialism and not sitting on the sidelines to address the problems of neoliberalism. That is where we have to go and that is what has to be coming more central in all our political minds. Thank you. Um, the, the point about... Uh Recognizing that the working class is much more than the industrial proletariat. I, I mean, I obviously completely 
agree. There's two things about the working class that I think are important. W one is that workers have lives. They're not just workers. They have lives outside the community. And so when there's organizing in the community, it isn't about organizing with others. First of all, it's about other dimensions of these same workers' lives. I mean, workers care about what the environment's doing to their kids or the school system or health care. So you have to think about class in broader terms than just being a worker. And then I absolutely agree with you that, uh, uh, you know, the, the question of people who aren't in unions, even uh, never mind just industrial unions. But I think that also raises the question not just of why are unions not doing this. It, it raises the question of what kind of organizational forms do we have to actually create that might be quite different. Maybe they don't need a union like traditional unions. Maybe we need kind of municipal unions that organize people uh, in the community uh, around their needs and actually spend a lot of time not negotiating higher wages for them, but negotiating certain social services like free transit. And maybe that's, uh, you know, so, so, so I think that that's the questions it raises. Um, I think the question about time, we should, I should have spent more time on it in my, in my comments. I, I think the question of what's happening to people's time is absolutely fundamental. You cannot have a movement that can change society if people are working longer hours so they don't have time to think, read, learn, and that they're overwhelmed with daily activities because they used to, you know, the left used to do this by exploiting their partner. And so if you can't do this, how do you actually get around this? And, you know, we all talk about the decline in manufacturing. When you look at the output in manufacturing, it's not declining. Manufacturing is growing in terms of value added. It's just they're doing it with fewer workers because productivity is rising, and we've stopped taking that in terms of time off. So the question of time off should be one of the most important demands that a labor movement that is thinking in terms of transforming society has to take on, not just to shift to say let's share the jobs and solidarity, which is important, but also so we can think and participate politically. You can't participate with that. We have to be very careful about just writing off finance as speculation. And we can have a long conversation on this, but finance is incredibly important to capitalism. It's actually important to how capitalism works. Finance has been critical to actually disciplining people, to disciplining uh, companies, and then through the companies disciplining workers, you don't do this, you won't get the capital. Disciplining governments, so it's been very important. It's crucial to how empire works. The fact that the U.S. can attract all this capital from everywhere, mobilize it from everywhere in the world, has to do with why the U.S. can play the kind of role it does. Uh, finance has been important for something that capital needs, which is always to shift things across sectors to where they're more profitable. Finance does that. Uh, when Leo Panich and I were uh, doing our research, we interviewed uh, the president of General Motors worldwide, and we asked him why in the early 80s, when uh, interest rates were raised to 18 percent, they didn't complain. I mean, this was going to kill the auto industry. In, in terms of people buying cars. How come you were so silent on it? And he said, because we agreed that it was necessary. It was necessary to break the back of inflation, which meant breaking working class power and slowing down the economy, even if it hurt us in the short run, was absolutely essential. So we shouldn't think that there is a split between you know, finance and uh, the big producers.